Welcome, everyone. Today, I will be presenting on radical relationship transformations. This webinar is sponsored by Pineapple Support and Mojo Hosts. My name is Dr. Tess Kilwine, and I am a contract therapist through Pineapple Support. I am presenting to you from Washington, D.C. today, but I originally live in Wyoming. So thank you again for being here. All right. So on the topic of relationships, I'd like to start with the different types of relationships. So all of us have relationships that are important and they come in a variety of different types. Essentially, a relationship is any connection between two people, whether that be positive, negative, neutral. Um, and being in a relationship doesn't require physical intimacy, emotional attachment, or commitment. So often when we hear relationships, we think of our intimate and sexual relationships. And we often fail to consider that relationships come in all types, including our family relationships, our friendships, acquaintances that we might interact with kind of on a case-by-case -case basis, our romantic and sexual relationships, work rela relationships, and situational relationships. So you might be, let's say, at a work conference or a work event, and you have a relationship with someone just in that situation. Or you go to a coffee shop, and you have a relationship with the person that um, often you know, meets you at the counter. So there are different types of relationships. And what we know is that having a variety of different types of relationships ensures that you have the support and connections that you need for emotional health and well being. So when we think of different types of relationships, these are the different categories. There's also different groups for our types of relationships that you may be familiar with as well. So one of those is platonic. So these are relationships that are typically close friendships or with family that don't involve sexual or romantic interest. Romantic, on the flip side of that, is those in which we experience feelings of love and attraction, and that might be through intimacy, commitment, or infatuation. Codependent relationships often refer to an imbalanced relationship where one partner might take care of the other one. But we also might see it in both ways, that both partners are sort of dependent upon each other and tend to take care of each other. And those who experience codependent relationships might often be lacking in relationships in other areas. So they might, have, might not have the support of friends and families, and that develops into codependency. Casual relationships typically refer to sex or intimacy without commitment. Um, sometimes that's one-sided. Sometimes it starts casual and turns into something else. But when we think of casual relationships, that often means you're entering an agreement with someone that there might be sex and intimacy, but not necessarily a commitment for the long term. Open relationships are a form of consensual non-monogamy where both partners might engage in intimacy, whether that's sexual or romantic, with other people. So there's different terms for this type of relationship, um, often referred to as ethical non-monogamy, often referred to as polyamory, which are all a little bit different, right? But essentially what this typically involves is having a primary relationship with one person. Um, and those two people agree to mutually agree to have intimacy with other people outside of that relationship. So in these dynamics, um, both partners might be open, one partner might be open, it sort of just depends on what that mutual agreement is. What research suggests is that over 20% of adults will engage in some form of an open or eth ethical non-monogamous relationship at some point in their adult life. Um, benefits of these types of relationships, um, it might mean and often requires increased communication and closeness with a primary partner and those other partners you're involved in um, can, you know, bring a sense of sexual freedom, freedom to explore different needs and desires you might have outside of your primary relationship. Um, there's also sometimes uh, consequences or pitfalls that comes from these type of relationships, especially early on when someone's exploring what type of open relationship they might be interested in. So that might lead to feelings of jealousy, emotional pain, boundary crossing, and ultimately what these relationships require is um, really great communication, right? Um, consent, setting boundaries with your partners, and communicating what everyone's comfortable with. Lastly, we often hear this term toxic relationships, and that typically refers to an unhealthy relationship that might cause some form of emotional, physical, or physical one person involved or both. 
people that we've talked about different forms of relationships, I'd like to talk about how relationships impact our well-being. So what we know is that social networks, having these social relationships are pivotal for both our physical and mental well-being. However, the opposite is also true. Well-being strengthens our relationships, and those who feel healthy, happy, content in their lives often make better friends, coworkers, partners, lovers. Now, what we know then on the slide here is that research has demonstrated that when we are part of these kind of well and healthy relationships, we experience reduced rates of anxiety and depression, increased resilience to stressful life events that might come up, higher general self-esteem and confidence in ourselves. We're more likely to have trusting and cooperative relationships um, with various people in our lives. In fact, it actually strengthens our immune systems. So it makes us more resilient to physical health stressors, um, might keep someone safe from things like the common cold, um, generally just feel better physically. Ultimately, those with fulfilling relationships have a greater sense of purpose. Um, what am I here for? That has found that human not having human interaction actually impairs our executive functioning. And what that means is that when we don't have fulfilling relationships, when we feel isolated, um, we're less able to control our thoughts and impulses. So we might think more negatively about ourselves, others in the world. We might become more impulsive, more anxious, and less emotionally resilient to life challenges. And unfortunately, what that's sometimes means is when we're feeling isolated, we're feeling lonely, um, we might be more likely to engage in impulsive behaviors and um, while pleasurable at the time, damage our physical health and our social relationships. So this can be things like alcohol and drug abuse, sedentary lifestyles, anger, resentment. So ultimately what I encourage people to do is think about your own life. When you feel lonely, when you feel isolated, does your behavior change? Do you sleep well? Do you eat differently? Do you make poorer decisions? And so thinking about relationships, when we feel fulfilled and we're surrounded by others, we tend to make better decisions about ourselves and the people around us. Next, I would like to talk a little bit about relationships in the adult entertainment industry. So a, a, a large fallacy and stigma that there often is in the industry is that entertainers don't have healthy and faithful relationships, and that's not true. Adult entertainers can and do have healthy and faithful relationships. And when we look at sort of the dynamics of different relationships in the industry, sex and even emotional you know, intimacy or friendships in the context of occupational duties is not considered cheating, right? But it does require open communication with our partners outside of the industry. So many and most adult entertainers have healthy, wholesome relationships, and they can also be monogamous if they choose. So some of the stigma we often find um, in this industry is that an adult entertainer might hire higher rates of STIs, right? And impact their sexual and relation in sexual and relationship intimacy. The opposite is actually true. What have we have found is that performers are known to take better care of their sexual health than those outside of the industry. Another fallacy is that performance sex mirrors real life sex. And that's not the case for everybody. Often, you know, these are actors, right? We're performing in this capacity. And that doesn't mean that sex and intimacy outside of performance mirrors that same type of sex and intimacy in the industry. What we do know is that, you know, individuals who have, you know, taken more time to look at their sexual health, taken more time to explore their own sexual and relationship identities, they may be more likely to experience sexual freedom, sexual autonomy, maybe more likely to, you know, explore forms of ethical non-monogamy, kink, BDSM, etc. But that doesn't generalize to all performers. So the key here is that a lot of these stigmatizing messages make assumptions and generalizations about performers and how that's going to impact their relationships outside of the industry. Um, what we know is that everyone experiences relationship, identity, attraction in their own personalized way. And what's required on that end is communicating with the people in our lives, whether that's our sexual partners, our family, our friends, our coworkers. 
So at the end, um, paid sex is work and people should be able to talk about the stress that they experience in their line of work. So there's often this um, stigma from partners of, I don't wanna hear about what's happening in work. I don't wanna hear about what's happening in your occupation. Um, these are actors doing a job, right? And some partners find that it's really helpful to develop social relationships with other actors so they can communicate about, you know, different type of stress that they might be experiencing through their occupation. One thing I do want to come back to is disclosures to friends, family, and partner. And again, this comes back to effective communication with the people in our lives. Is how do we disclose? And at what point do we disclose to our partners, our family, and friends about the occupations that we engage in? That is a personal choice, right? And so everyone knows their family and their the people in their lives best and gets to decide at what point do we disclose our occupation. Um, because of stigma that's often surrounding the adult entertainment industry, each individual needs to consider safety, emotional safety when making those decisions about disclosures. All right. So now to talk a little bit about healthy and unhealthy relationships. What I have up here are two different wheels. On the left side is a wheel that describes healthy relationships. On the right side is a wheel that describes unhealthy relationships. So let's start with healthy relationships. Ultimately, when we look around this wheel, what we see is that healthy relationships involve trust, mutual respect, openness, honesty, and affection. These are the relationships that when we look at health benefits, both physical and emotional, they're coming from these types of relationships, right? Ultimately, good communication is the hallmark of a healthy relationship. So being able to be honest and accountable, to be able to negotiate and be fair, if we look across this wheel, it's things like not making excuses um, for actions. It's admitting when you're wrong. Um, it's being able to openly communicate when you feel hurt or when you feel misheard. Um, it's agreeing on compromises that benefit both, um, and we're not compromising who we are and our values, right? Um, accepting change, agreeing to disagree, and fighting well. So that's something that I'll come back to in a future slide of, you know, there are going to be arguments in all types of relationships, not just our sexual and intimate relationships. And how do we maintain respect? How do we maintain kind of accountability and honesty when we are disagreeing with other people? Another key about our healthy relationships is that these are reciprocal. And what that means is that in a reciprocal relationship, there's naturally we're engaging in this give and take, right? It provides mutual benefits to both partners, but it's not transactional. It's not this idea that, well, if I do this for you, then you owe me this, right? Really, if we're looking at reciprocal relationships, it's just this natural give and take where if you need support, I'm providing that to you in this moment and vice versa. It's not transactional. So moving over to the right side, this is typically what we use to describe unhealthy relationships. Now, some of these won't apply to everyone, right? So if you don't have children, you're not looking at using children. Um, but generally, when we look at our unhealthy relationships, some themes arise. First, um, the emotional, physical, and psychological well-being of one partner, if not both, is undermined or threatened. And when we don't feel like our emotional and our physical and our psychological safety, if we don't feel that, that's when we build things like resentment, um, we reduce our resiliency to stress or immune system struggle, right? Going back to that previous slide about well-being, when we don't have healthy relationships, and in fact, we have unhealthy relationships, there's lots of consequences to our well-being. Those who are engaged in unhealthy relationships or have that type of relationship in their life are often left feeling ashamed, humiliated, misunderstood, or unsupported, generally. Any relationship can be unhealthy. So while we look at these relationships, and again, we often think about our more sexual and romantic relationships, unhealthy relationships can develop with anyone family, our friendships, our workplace. And so thinking about the different forms of relationships again. Ultimately, what can happen is unhealthy relationships can become mutual if you both become unkind, critical, insecure, and negative. It can sort of build into an unhealthy relationships on both sides, uh, regardless of which side it started on. These often and sometimes do result from experiences in past relationships. So often individuals who have a history of their own abuse may reflect those abusive tactics in their own relationships. 
Now, that doesn't mean that every individual who has experienced a history of abuse will then become abusers. What it means is that those who are abusive often have that in their history. So I want to make that really clear. Lastly, um, like I mentioned, these types of relationships take a serious toll on our health. Um, what we have found is that they develop a higher sense of loneliness, which has a lot of consequences that I mentioned previously. They impact our heart health. Um, they're really just negative for our bodies, right? So I'm going to pose just a reflection question for anyone watching this webinar is to think about the relationships in your own life. Generally, which wheel do these relationships fall under? Are there pieces of unhealthy relationships that might show up even in an unhealthy relationship? Maybe one of these little slides here. Um, do you have some relationships that fall under healthy and some after un unhealthy? So I encourage you to just take a moment to look at this slide, read through the different um, pieces here and look at, okay, in these relationships in my life, am I seeing more or the other? And if you're seeing more of this unhealthy relationship style, that's in your relationships, Take a moment to ask yourself, okay, is there something I need to communicate with my partner? Is there something I need to talk with about people that are in my life and are healthy about this unhealthy relationship? And ultimately, do I need to start asking the question, is this a relationship that isn't good for me and my health? All right. So a little bit about defining our relationships. Uh, we've talked about a variety of different relationships types, a variety of different descriptors for those relationship types. But ultimately, you know, we don't know what our relationships are unless we take time and we take a moment to define. Two questions that I encourage people to ask when they're defining their relationships is one, what matters to you? What are your values? What is important to you in a relationship? And two, how does the other person feel, right? And so we may have certain type of feelings towards someone, but it's really important to consider what does the other person want? What does the other person feel? And make sure that all interactions are consensual. So some questions that I'll pose here, if you're maybe in this situation where we sometimes refer to them as situationships, and so not quite knowing like what are um, you know, mutually, what's going on here? What is the relationship? Who is it serving? Some questions that you might ask yourself or other important people, or even that person you're trying to define the relationship with. Five. So one, do you have platonic, romantic, or natural feelings for one another? And is that mutual, right, on each side? Two, what does each person hope to get out of the relationship? So again, that might differ between the two people involved in the dynamic. Number three, how much time do you want to spend together? And this is a really important one, especially when we're looking at the different relationships we might have in our life. Looking at, you know, how much time are you spending in those other relationships in your occupation, parenting, if that's something for you, your hobbies, recreational activities. How much time do you really realistically have to spend with that person? And how much time do you want to spend together? If there's a big difference between the two people on that, it's a conversation that's important to have. So it doesn't build into things like jealousy, resentment. Number four, where do you see the relationship going? Now, not all relationships that we enter have to have an expectation of commitment in long term. However, it's important to have that conversation with people. So we know where do you see this relationship going? Where do I see this relationship going? And making sure that you're both mutually agreeing on what that looks like. And lastly, are you currently involved with or want to be involved with other people? So going back to our previous slide, when we're talking about open relationships, those who are engaged in polyamory practices, ethical non-monogamy, 20% of adults will engage in a form of an open relationship at some time in, some time in their adult life. I believe that number is going to increase significantly and is probably an underestimate, right? So there's this, ultimately, traditionally, there was an assumption that relationships mean between two people, and that's it when it comes to sex and intimacy. But we're finding that that's not the best practice for a lot of people. A lot of people have different needs and desires that might be met by different partners. People can and do have healthy, non-monogamous relationships. Key here, as I've mentioned previously, is communication and mutually agreeing upon what these relationships looks like. So asking the question, are you currently involved with other people? Do you want to be involved with other people? Um, how do you feel about me being involved with other people? And coming to an agreement that best serves both people in the relationship. 
So through this exploration, what you might find is that you're both on the same page. Um, you agree with these questions. You feel the same way about each other. Your hopes and desires for the relationship match. You want to spend the same amount of time together. Wonderful. You proceed with the relationship. Unfortunately, sometimes through this exploration, you find that you want different things out of your relationship. Sometimes those are reconcilable, right? So in relationships, compromise is one of those things that we go back to the healthy wheel. Um, and you find you can move forward in the relationship. However, sometimes during this discovery, you find that there are non-negotiables. So your values, um, your feelings for each other, the type of time you want to spend together, whether you want to be involved with other people, doesn't match the needs of the other person. And what I encourage people to think about is, would you rather find that out early on this exploration stage before being in a relationship more in the long term and then finding out there's a non-negotiable? Again, like I've mentioned, that once you define these relationships, there doesn't have to be an assumption that you're committing for the long term. Many relationships we have in our lives are temporary, and they still serve a really important purpose for us. So having that conversation, you know, is this something we need to commit to in the long term? Do we see how it goes? Or do we know it's not going to be long term when we set up that expectation? Instead, you know, Ultimately, when we're defining relationships, this is a way for you to both understand the boundaries and expectations of your relationships. If we can set these types of boundaries early on in our relationships, it reduces the likelihood that we develop into boundary crossing, resentment, whatever it may be. Now that you've defined relationships, I want to talk more about how we might improve our relationships. So some recommendations on the to use to improve the relationships that you already have or the relationships that you're in the process of developing. Number one is staying connected and spending quality time together. What we know is that actually being intentional and spending that quality time together is one of, a, one of the hallmarks of a good relationship. Number two is setting and maintaining effective boundaries. And again, this is something that we want to communicate about effectively early in our relationships. Everyone has different boundaries. And if we assume that someone we're in a relationship with has the same boundaries as us or the people we've been with, then we get into things like boundary crossings, right? And so being able to communicate what are your boundaries and then when a boundary crossing happens, being able to communicate that with someone as well. Hey, this was a boundary. This didn't feel right for me. This is something I'm not comfortable with. And how can we change that moving forward? I want to make a note here, especially for individuals who have experienced some type of trauma in their past, especially sexual trauma, boundary crossings have already happened to them in a really significant way. And so sometimes what might seem like a minor boundary crossing or something that doesn't feel so significant can feel really significant to that person because of the experiences that they've had in their past. So this is always up to the individual, right? But at what point do you maybe communicate what some of those future or those previous boundary crossings are, what kind of triggers might show up in relationships, whether that's emotional intimacy or sexual intimacy, so we can prevent the likelihood of a boundary crossing happening. Number three, again, one of the hallmarks of, you know, relationships, healthy relationships is prioritizing communication. So communication, ultimately what this means is not allowing concerns that are present in your relationship to grow in silence and build into resentment. So often when I'm working with couples or I'm working with individuals who, you know, have gotten to that point of resentment, it was something that can, could have been communicated really early on in the relationship, and maybe it never would have gotten to that point of resentment or gotten to that point of feeling really uncomfortable with a partner. And so prioritizing communication, even about those small things, because the small things often develop into larger things that are then more difficult to come back and resolve. Number four is enhancing emotional safety and expressing vulnerability. This is what I found to be one of the most challenging aspects of relationships is how do you feel emotionally safe with a person? How do you express when you're feeling sad, when something difficult happened at work, when you're feeling hurt by something that they did to you? And so the only way really to do this is, again, open communication and being willing to be vulnerable in relationships. This is going to look different for everyone, and it's going to be more challenging for some people than other vulnerability can be really difficult in relationships, often because of past experiences, right? So those, again, who have experienced boundary crossings in the past, they've maybe experienced a trauma in the past, might have a more difficult time being vulnerable and feeling emotionally safe in relationships. 
Next one, and what I believe to be one of the most important aspects of a healthy relationship is maintaining a sense of self and autonomy. So what that means is, you know, maintaining an identity outside of a primary relationship. Often when we look at codependent or toxic romantic relationships specifically, Individuals in those dynamics don't have a lot of other relationship types, right? They may not be spending a lot of time with friends or family. They may not be engaged in hobbies or community or, um, you know, recreational activities. And so when we lose that sense of ourselves and our autonomy, we can really be lost in relationships. And what that might mean is that if that relationship were to end, it really can feel like a world comes crashing down because that was your world at the time. It also can mean when a codependent relationship does become abusive or toxic, it's a lot harder to leave because of the support systems one might need around them in order to leave aren't there. So again, one of my keys for improving relationships is no matter how happy you are in that relationship, no matter how healthy it is, it's still important to maintain a sense of self and autonomy, still important to have your own friends, still important to do your own work, still important to have interests outside of that relationship. And that's on both ends. Next, um, I mentioned previously this idea of fighting well, and what that means is keeping our argument short, focused, and respectful. There are going to be disagreements and challenges in all types of relationships that we have. Um, disagreement is healthy, right? And being able to communicate when you do disagree or you don't think the same way about something. But what's important here is to keep these arguments short, right? Recognizing when it's time to agree to disagree. Now, exceptions to that, when we're talking about boundaries or we're talking about values, I'm not asking people to agree to disagree there, right? That might mean something different. Taking a look at the relationship, is this serving me? Are we on the same page? However, when they're smaller arguments, keep them short, keep them focused on the argument at hand instead of bringing in other aspects of the relationship or other larger issues, right? And keep them respectful. So we can fight well, we can argue without um, criticizing our partners, criticizing our family members, whoever it might be, um, without being unkind. Next is to listen carefully to thoughts and feelings. And so often in relationships, especially those we might have had long term, is we stop listening to what is the person saying about what they're thinking and feeling, whereas those are really the tools that we can use to have communication to eliminate resentment. So listen, what is this person saying about how they feel? Um, what are the type of thoughts that they're having about their relationship? And being in tune to that from the other partner. Last one, which can often be the most difficult, is being okay ending unhealthy relationships. Now, we've talked a lot about the different types of relationships, why relationships are important for our well-being, how to improve these relationships. But at the end of the day, not every relationship serves us well. Not every relationship was meant to be and meant to be in the long term. And so that means recognizing when it is time to let go, being okay ending these relationships. And I'll go back to this slide here. If you're starting to ask questions about a relationship, maybe you've tried a lot of these improvement strategies about communication, setting boundaries. If you're still finding that maybe you're feeling emotionally unwell, you're feeling pain, you're feeling resentment, then it's time to take a look at this unhealthy relationship wheel here. Ask yourself, is this person in the dynamic, again, does not have to be a romantic relationship, can be friends, family, and yes, we can end those relationships too. Is that person using coercion or threats? And so this might be actual threats to physical harm or safety. Maybe it's even carrying them out. Um, but it can look different too. It can look like making threats to hurt themselves if you were to leave. So maybe you're exploring leaving that relationship and you've mentioned that to that partner. And the partner makes comments like, well, I couldn't live without you. Or, um, you know, I would, I would hurt myself if you left. That's an abusive tactic. That's manipulative. And that's aimed to keep people in unhealthy relationships um, when they're exploring leaving can also be things like making you do illegal things, making you do things that are outside of your values, coercing you to engage in that. Well, if you don't do this, it means you don't really love me, right? So is that showing up in a relationship? Using intimidation is another tactic that might come up. And so this is making you feel afraid uh, for your physical or emotional well-being, um, destroying things. So maybe they're not hitting you, but they're destroying other objects in the room. Um, and maybe it's even displaying a weapon. 
Using emotional abuse, and now this is usually a bit more common than actual forms of threats and intimidation and physical harm, but this might be putting you down, um, using negative comments, being really critical of you, making comments like, well, no one will ever love you after me. That is a form of emotional abuse that is meant to break down an individual so they feel like they can't leave. They feel like if I end this relationship, I'll never have another one. I'm damaged. No one will ever love me. That's an abusive tactic that people use to keep people in unhealthy relationships. Maybe they're blaming you for issues in the relationship. We often refer to that as gaslighting. So making you question, gosh, is this really real? Am I at fault here? Am I making this up? And making you feel guilty for things that aren't your fault, right? Making you feel guilty for even questioning that the relationship isn't going in a healthy direction. Using isolation is one I, I really want to highlight because if we look at abusive relationships, often what we see is that over time, the other relationships we've talked about, family, friends, coworkers, acquaintances, start to reduce. And then you're spending more time um, with a primary partner in unhealthy relationship. And that's by design. And so using isolation, keeping you away from friends and family, um, limiting your contact with other people, using jealousy as an excuse is a tactic to keep you away from people that might highlight, hey, this relationship sounds unhealthy to me. Maybe it's start to question whether we go and to limit the resources that you would have if you did go. And so again, going back to these unhealthy relationships, recognizing when it's time to let go, these are the type of signs that might show up. Just a few more here. It might be minimizing, denying, and blaming. So saying that you actually deserve to be treated in an un unwell way, um, minimizing the seriousness of the abuse, like, oh, this isn't really that bad, um, denying that the abuse even happened. And so we see gaslighting in this area as well, is that you may feel you've tried all these things to improve the relationship, it's still not working, um, and then it's completely denied by another partner. That's a sign of an unhealthy relationship. For those that do have children, um, or maybe it's other people you're taking care of, maybe it's roommates, whatever it might be, um, threats, right? So threatening to take away access to that person, um, using those people to make you feel guilty. So maybe spreading lies, um, spreading rumors to your family, things like that. And so using other relationships to make it more difficult for you to lead the unhealthy one. And lastly, using privilege. And so often when we look at these unhealthy relationships that develop over time, someone might have more power and privilege than the other person. That might mean finance, that might mean reputationally, it might mean a higher position in work. And so, you know, treating you like you're below them, I'm expecting you to kind of provide and look after them, I'm defining gender roles in a really specific way, but ultimately using this privilege to keep you in the unhealthy relationship because no one will believe you if you go, right? That person is in a higher position. Um, so using that as sort of a mechanism to keep you in the relationship. Okay. So back to improving relationships, I do like to spend time on that unhealthy piece because most of us at some point in our life will have an unhealthy relationship. We'll also have really great and healthy relationships too, as long as we're engaging in these different strategies to improve and maintain our relationships. So before we wrap up the webinar, what I want to introduce is a intervention or a strategy that people can use in their actual relationships that they have now. So what this is called is weekly connections. And what this means is that each week you're setting aside quality time devoted to creating or strengthening relationships. These weekly connections can happen in all forms of relationships. They can happen with a dating partner. They can happen with a group of coworkers, friends, family, whatever it might be. Use it as an excuse to have fun and get together. Um, we tend to prioritize productive activities. So cleaning the house, um, doing something work related. We tend to prioritize those over actual deep social connection, despite what the research shows about these connections, that important connections are important for our well-being, right? And what we know is when we're engaging in kind of connection and social activities, we're much more productive at the things that we do outside of it. So how this looks is number one, each month, uh, week, whatever it might be, plan opportunities for connection with the most important people in your life or set up a time to meet someone new. Maybe you've 
now gotten to the end of this webinar and you've realized I don't have a lot of relationships outside of maybe it's work or maybe it's a romantic partner. And so what we encourage people to do is take a look at the next month. Make sure in your calendar at least once each week you are setting aside time for that connection. So that could be fun outings. It could be a shared meal. It could just be watching a movie, right? And so we all have different schedules. We have different finances. And so this weekly connection can be whatever you need it to be. Number two, make it a recurring ritual. And what this means is, you know, create a recurring connection. So it's easier for everyone to make it happen. If we say, okay, the second Sunday of every month, we're going to go to brunch, right? That would be a recurring ritual. Um, let's say you have children, right? So every, you know, other Thursday, we're going to do a play date with the kids, right? So we can have some mom time and then the kids can play. So if you, you know, schedule a Friday game night, a Saturday date night, Sunday video chats, whatever it might be, we're more likely to actually make that commitment and make it happen in a recurring way. Number three is um, starting small and recognizing that quality is more important than quantity. So, you know, maybe we don't have a whole Saturday afternoon that we can devote to something fun. That's just not feasible for everybody. Um, so maybe it is just 10 minutes. Maybe it's a phone call, five minute phone call. Maybe it's a video chat. Maybe it's a walk, right? Maybe it's a lunch date. Um, so be present, even if it's only for 10 minutes, prioritizing the quality of that interaction over the quantity. Lastly is to really savor and appreciate the time. And so what this means is stop and appreciate how precious any, any quality time we spend with those you care about is. So maybe you do that verbally. Maybe you tell them, hey, this was really nice to connect. Maybe you shoot a text of appreciation afterwards, or maybe you actually plan the next one. So let's say there's someone, a neighbor, or someone that you've seen around that you think you might get along with, right? And you decide, hey, let's go on a walk or let's go grab a coffee. And you find that you two connect, plan the next one, right? And so this can be part of that weekly connection. Generally, what research shows is if you're engaging in some type of social activity or connection like this each week, that's going to have a lot of benefits on our well-being. Wonderful. So I want to go back to here just to recap. So to recap on this webinar, there are different types of relationships. Often when we hear relationships, we think of romance and sex, and that's not always the case. And so when we're thinking about improving our relationships and wanting to be present in our relationships, let's think about those as a whole. So that might be our family, our friends, people at work, our primary relationships. Number two, what we know is that relationships are important for our well-being. Research shows a whole host of benefits on our physical and emotional well-being if we stay connected with other people. It also shows the opposite, that if we're isolated, if we're not connecting with other people, there could be really real consequences on our emotional and physical health, right? We might engage in substance use, we might engage in risk behavior, and we might push people away. And so keeping people close to us um, is important for our well-being. Number three, there are some keys about relationships in the adult entertainment industry specifically. So, you know, navigating consent and boundaries with our partners, um, recognizing that we're doing that in our place of work as well. Um, recognizing when and how to disclose to the people in our life, fighting the stigma of adult entertainment work. And so recognizing that people have misperceptions about sexual health and relationships in the industry that aren't accurate. Um, encouraging yourself and your partners to navigate different sexual relationship and identities and interests and communicate that with our partners. And then lastly, recognizing that you should, you can and should talk about your occupational stress with the people in your life. If you feel like that you can't do that with your primary partner, then finding other people you can, developing other relationships in the industry, um, using your family, friends, whatever it might be. Next, we talked about the healthy versus unhealthy wheel. So this is one that I encourage people to actually maybe even pause this webinar and take a minute to look at these different dynamics. Again, on the left side, we have what's typically referred to as our healthy relationships. On the right side are typically what's referred to as our unhealthy relationships. I do want to make a note that not all relationships are perfect. And you might look at this healthy relationship wheel and be like, I've never had one of these, or this seems unrealistic. I get that. Um, sometimes what can happen is that there might be these aspects of an unhealthy relationship that start to show up. 
If you communicate them early and directly, that's how we prevent this wheel from turning into an unhealthy relationship. So yes, um, disagreements, arguments are natural. Um, making comments that you don't feel great about are natural. Um, you know, getting jealous is natural. These things are really natural, right? But the idea is when these type of unhealthy relationship patterns come up, we're using these healthy relationship patterns like honesty, accountability, negotiating the fairness to make sure it doesn't develop into an unhealthy one. Defining relationships. So making sure that we're taking the time to ask these questions about ourselves and about our relationships. You know, recognizing that sometimes we're going to have different desires in our relationships. We're going to have different definitions. Now, sometimes we match up. Sometimes there's some discrepancies, but we can make it work. And sometimes it's not a relationship that's going to work for us and finding that out early. Improving relationships. So we went through the different strategies that one might use to improve relationships. The three hallmarks I again want to highlight is spending that quality time together, communicating effectively, and maintaining a sense of self and autonomy. So spending that actual quality time together, you know, sitting on opposite couches and the opposite side of the room and being on your phone or computer and doing something different isn't really quality time together, right? So actually taking, even if it's just 10 minutes to do something together, that's quality time. Um, prioritizing communication. So that's communicating about concerns that come up in the relationship early and often. So it doesn't build into resentment. It doesn't build into difficulties and in where we see that unhealthy relationship wheel. And lastly, maintaining a sense of self and autonomy in our relationships. So recognizing, yeah, we might want to spend a lot of time with this friend or this partner, right? It's still important to be spending time with our other relationships, engaging in our interests and identities outside of that relationship. And then lastly, I shared with you the weekly connection. And so again, if there's nothing that you take out of this webinar, this could be one tool. This could be something after the webinar that you decide, okay, I'm going to look at my month and I see I'm not doing anything for myself in terms of connection. I'm putting all of my time into work or I'm putting it into maybe one relationship and not others. This could be one step that you could take to improve your well-being and improve your overall social health. Um, schedule something in your calendar. Maybe there's someone you've wanted to reach out to and you haven't had the courage or you felt like you haven't had the time. Um, I encourage everyone to take that step today. All right. So thank you everyone for tuning into this webinar on radical relationship transformations. Again, um, my name is Dr. Tess Kilwine, who provided the webinar that was supported by Pineapple Support and Mojo Host. Thank you.